weekly piano here. Finally, it got quiet around here. Um, we're at the Wells Fargo Center in Philadelphia right now. I just played opening for Imagine Dragons. Um, I'm supporting the artist Halsey right now on tour um, on a bunch of arenas across the country. And I wanted to take this time to respond to Daniel. Thank you very much for your awesome question. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy the answer or get a lot of, out of the answer to this one. Um, because it can often be confusing when you are a beginner um, and you see people who can do a lot with jazz, function in complicated contexts, how they actually get to that end where they can really be functional in a worldwide context in jazz. So um, I'm going to go through at least what I have done throughout my history uh, to get to where I am now. Um, so let's start with technicality. You need to know how to navigate the instrument. You need to know what's, what keys make what sounds and how they interact with each other. So we start off with our scales. Make sure you have your scales. <laughs> quickly and all the keys just just so you see like so you can get the finger really really quickly if you want to like really nitpick on the video actually I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because I'm realizing this video is gonna get longer than 10 minutes if I keep doing it but there are lots of places online where you can find the technical fingerings for scales. In fact, I think I have a video of that that I did a while ago. Um, okay, so get your scales. Um, get your hand placement. Hand placement is very, very important. You do not want to have tense hands. You want to have a very relaxed hand and let it rest basically right above the keys. And your fingers should be working in contrary motion. So let your thumb fall and then your, lift your thumb up when your next finger goes, lift that finger up when the next finger goes down, but it's just like wiggling your fingers, basically. Um, you don't want to ever be like lift tape, like you see Keith Jarrett doing it, and I mean, you know, he's one of the best pianists in the world, but I would not recommend playing like that because you'll destroy your hands and have all sorts of physical problems. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> uh, do some other exercises like Behringer. There's a there, there's a Behringer exercise. I think they're. I don't think it's Behringer, like the other guy. But I think it's Behringer. And I I I'll make a download link in the description of this video for you to get those exercises because I actually have them. But they are like. <laughs> exercises. Um, there's another exercise that a teacher that I had named Jim Trumpeter taught me that I don't know where it's located so I'm just going to show you. This is you do this is for C and then you go up in half steps but if you're doing it in C it's this. some space issues on my iPhone. I adjusted the camera angle also, so this should be a little bit better. Um, anyway, we were just finishing the trumpeter, the Jim Trumpeter's exercise, so now there's another thing that, um, it, it's an exercise for the using the thumb and interacting with the other fingers correctly, um, and it's an exercise that Herbie Hancock showed me, so I do it every day. I figure if Herbie does it, it's definitely worth all of us doing every day. Um, so it, it just goes like this. You, you, have your, you pick the uh, one note, I start on C for the thumb, 
and then you do half steps surrounding it with the first finger. finger um, and then you move it up a half step and up a half step and up a half step it takes way too much time if you try to go through all of the um, all the tones all, all the half steps but I would recommend doing like 10 minutes of that one I, I usually do about 10 minutes of that at five, between 5 and 10 minutes of that every day um, and then oh by the way when you're doing all these exercises make sure you're using a metronome and make sure you're keeping very precise time you want to be feeling the time along with the metronome and not relying on the metronome, but developing that inner pulse so that you develop a good sense of time, which is so important to the stuff we're about to get into. So, anyway, um, next is you should learn some Bach. Get some classical stuff under your belt. I do a, a few uh, a few snippets of pieces. I do the um, the jig in. G minor, which is this. Yeah, it, it, it goes, it goes on. Um, and then I do the minuet in C minor. I'm rushing through this right now, just for the sake of. Of speed, um, so then I also do the prelude in in uh, A minor. Um, not the fugue; I haven't quite gotten there yet because I don't really have time. But the, that that's the one that starts like this. message me if you actually want them. You can do any Bach. All of it is amazing and the, probably some of the best music in all of recorded history. So uh, that's what I do for technicality, just to get an understanding of the key bed and where the notes are and how they sound with each other in different contexts. So the next step is theory. Now mind you, each of these, you don't get technicality and then theory. You get bits of technicality and bits of theory all at the same time, but I'm going through the, um, the this progression, uh, I'll go through the progression of theory now from like very beginner to very advanced. So first get all of your, um, all the modes. So you, we have our major mode I showed you earlier, right? So then you have, um, how should I show this? There are different ways to, to think about the modes. I prefer to just go through it by, by flatting notes and sticking with the same root rather than superimposing different roots because it's, it's, it creates a greater depth of understanding of, the, of what the modes actually sound like. Um, so that's C major. of this because I can't remember that. It's really, it's like 12.47 a.m. here. Anyway, so, oh, Lydian, that's it, duh. It's Lydian. Mixolydian. Um, Aeolian. I think this is Locrian. Oh, no, that's Phrygian. since I took music theory class, I've just been using all those modes, but not naming them. So um, I'm sure people in the comments will be able to correct me and chastise me for not knowing that. So please do. Uh, so learn all of those and play them in four octaves in all the keys. So you're doing... <laughs> Um, with 
the right fingering, which you can find on various forums online. Uh, so that, you know, that I did that, then I would do uh, the, um, up and down, and then the up and down, and, you know, through all, all the different modes. Um, okay. Oh, and, and then diminish. Make sure you have the half hole diminished. steps from now. So then, oh, let me make sure it's still recording, because I was having the space issues earlier. Please still be recording. Yes, it is. Great. Okay, we'll see how much longer I have before it dies. Um, okay, triads is the next thing. So you got your major, your major triad, and your minor triad. That's great. Make sure you have those in all keys. says play an A minor triad, make sure you can go right there and play it. Um, then extensions. So you have one, three, five to create the triad, right? And then you extend it and you do one, three, five, seven. Um, because you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it goes in, um, you skip a note for every, when you're creating these, these, these patterns. Um, so, so then you're in C and you have one, three, five, seven, the major seven. Now you have a bunch of different combinations because you can do your Lydian scale, which gives a dominant seven. You can do your minor scale, which gives a minor seven. You can do your, um, Jesus, Locrian scale. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's what it's called, uh, which gives you a half diminished seven and you can do your diminished scale which gives you a diminished seven. So make sure you know all of those in all of the keys. Um, learning classical music helps with this too because that's all about that. Um, the next extension is the nine. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so now you have a bunch of different combinations. You have your dominant seven with the nine, so it's a dominant nine chord. And this is where it gets kind of cool because, um, well, I'll show you later what leads, well, no, I'll show you now. Okay, dominant seven leads to, if you're in C, it leads to five below. C dominant seven leads to F major. That's the circle of fifths, which you should know. Um, so it's basically just down in fifths. But if you, I can't go all the way down, so it's... like a pattern that loops around because you can have a dominant going to one. So it's five, one, and five, one, one. Was that right? That was right. <laughs> so that's the circle of fifths. Use it and make, and all I did was make a, a, a chord, a dominant seven. So now going to the nine, you have your dominant nine that leads to the, the that essentially is the five leading to the one. Oh, also, one thing I want to mention now is you have to pay attention to the tritone. That's something a lot of people don't talk about, but it's so important. The reason that it moves in that direction is because you have a tritone. So a tritone is three whole steps. One, two, three. That's your tritone in C. And the, the, the notes that are moving are this, which is the seven of F moving to the one of F, and the four of F moving to the three of F, which is a tritone moving to a major third. And that's the, something you can use melodically, you know, like... think of that it's so important um okay so now we got the nine one three five seven nine it adds another 
another color, but it can also add another tritone. It's a cool thing because you can flat the nine, and then you have this tritone leading there, or this tritone leading there, which is even more natural because then you don't have a whole step there, you just have a half step there. A tritone, when you have a tritone, one of the tones can move a whole step if you want it to. Um, because it works the same upside down as it does right side, right side up, and all minor music is actually just major music completely upside down. But that's an entirely different conversation. Um, <laughs> let me make sure this is still recording. Sweet, it is. Okay, I'm going to stop this for a second. Yeah, this is turning into a long video, I'm sorry. But I'm going to try to keep going. Okay. This is turning into a marathon video. I'm sorry about that, guys. I just really want to get the whole overview here, and it's really hard to fit the entirety of a lifetime of music, musical development, into a 10-minute video. So it might be a 20 or maybe even 30-minute video. Who knows? Um, I guess you know by now because it's on YouTube when you're watching it. Anyway, the next thing I wanted to talk about was... Oh, yeah, so upper extensions. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. 1, 3, 5, dominant 7, 9. 1, 3, 5, down to 7, flat 9, or sharp 9, that's the 9, you can flat it or sharp it, and now you're getting jazzy, you know? You know, that's, um, now, now you start to hear that. Okay, so those are extensions, you can now go all the way up to the 11 and the 13. turns into different colors that you can use, and I could do a whole video on a tiny, tiny bit of that. Um, so let's go on to uh, two five ones. So now that you've got that, you have the ability to do a minor chord, let's do D minor, to a dominant chord, let's, what, let's, well, so, okay, D minor, to a dominant chord five steps below it, to a major chord, five step below that, going around the circle of fifths from minor to dominant to major. That's the foundation of, well, music in general, but especially jazz. So you do minor, dominant, major, and then you can go to the six, which is just putting you back around the circle a little bit, because then you go, that's dominant, minor, dominant, major, um, all going down in fifths. Master that, um, and recognize where the tritone is leading in all of that. Um, okay, let's see what's next. Um, okay, vocabulary in the two five one. I'm attaching a sheet of a. If this is this sheet is like gold to a jazz musician, you should sleep with this sheet under your pillow so that you can siphon it into your brain if you are crazy and believe in things that don't actually happen. Um, but at least practice it. So this is your minor chord. This is one of the one of the things on the sheet. So that's a two five one lick. And you'll notice it's doing a lot of things with upper extensions. In the D minor it's doing the 9 to the 11 to the 9, up the chord pattern to back to the 11, and then leading to the sharp 5, or the flat 13, however you want to think about it, of the dominant, which is G, going over the sharp 9 and the flat 9 to the 5 of C, which is the 1. And get that in all the keys. It's been a little while since I've done this verbatim. But so. Okay, so that that's melodic stuff in two five ones. Then there's the, le the left hand, which you saw what I was doing. Minor chord, dominant chord, major chord, and now I'm. Often when I do that, I'm not playing the one. I, 
that's the one, so I'll replace it with like the nine. So you get that crunch there, that's nice. So that, and then I go to like that, so that's, now this is actually a G. But I've got the seven, the nine, the three, and the thirteen in there. Um, and then to the one, where I have the three, the five, the thirteen, and the nine in there. So I can like... Do that in any key with your left hand, or this is one I really like. That's simple. So three, five, seven, nine of D. Then, for voice leading purposes, you want to keep the notes as close as possible together. So you'll start with this, the, this which is now the seven of G, to the nine of G, to the three of G, to the thirteen of G, to the three, five, seven, nine of C. So get that in every key. I would recommend that. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, practice, once you get that, practice those licks. Okay, and then there's rhythm in there, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, okay, you got the pattern. Oh, and now, double-handed comping. So, you saw this, um, or right, well, let's do, let's just say this one. Um, the three five seven nine of D. Drop two voicings is something or something you should get. So you just do a pattern like this, which you would do with one hand. You take the second note down and you drop it an octave. So you have that. It sounds better an octave down. That's D. And then, for voice leading purposes, you know that same thing that we did before that, but then take that and drop it down, and then that, drop that an octave down. It's a little, little muddy down there, I guess. Um, but that's what a drop two voicing is. It's just this, or, so like this becomes this, and like, this becomes, oh, you don't actually want to do that one. This, so this becomes like, that. so if you're in C minor, Just like doing a comping pattern like that, dropping that, dropping the second voice down an octave. Um, okay, that's drop two. You should get that. Next is what? Comping voice leading. I wrote a few notes to myself over on my computer over there. Um, okay, so yeah, that's that's the basics of jazz theory. I know there's a lot more, but that's like the basic basic stuff. So now we get into another level of it, which there are three elements to actually making music within a context of jazz and not just playing a bunch of vocabulary. There's melody, there's rhythm, and there's harmony. Ta-da! So that trifecta, which I'm not going to draw a pie chart for you right now, um, they would all be equal slices of the pie. Melody, to learn that, learn a bunch of tunes. I'm also attaching a list of tunes that you should know that my old teacher, Chip Stevens, gave to me. Um, it's got Girl from Ipanema, Blue Bossa, um, some blues, some like Olio, a bunch of different, like, I mean, some rhythm changes tunes. Olio is a rhythm changes tune. Um, yeah. So that is how you can learn melodies by learning those tunes and learn a few of them in all the keys. It's really, really helpful. Um, you know, so like. Then rhythm. Listen to some Count Basie orchestra and just get their rhythms. I did a whole video on it. You can look it up, but it's just rhythms like. You know, that's like. All that 
big band stuff. Just get big band rhythms. Get some bossa nova and actually study a little bit of real bossa nova. People fake it all the time, but you really have to emphasize the two. You know, so um, then for harmony, you need to transcribe some of the great pianists because that is where you'll get your real harmonic depth, which we're going to talk about transcribing um, in a little bit. Uh, three artists in particular. Okay, let's see where we are on the camera. Do I have time left? Okay, it's still recording. Let's see if I can not do too much video editing after this. Next is, okay, so be able to do the following things on a bunch of jazz standards once you have your melody rhythm and your harmony. You want to be able to play the melody, so I'll just keep with Girl from Ipanema. Mind you, you're doing this all to a metronome. Um, play along with the Joe Beam recording, it's actually really fun and it's so beautiful. So, so beautiful. Um, so do that. You want to be able to comp with both hands. So be able to do like... I'm not going to describe to you what that was exactly, but that was just going through the changes with a bossa nova rhythm. Um, using the drop two voicings that I described earlier. Uh, you want to be able to play the melody and comp, so... Um, and you want to be able to play a bass pattern in comp, so... just from listening to the recordings um, of anything. Use bassists. You want to play the... I haven't played the melody in comp. I said that. Um, oh, and play the melody in the bass line, so... If you, if you can, like... If you really want to get into it, do all of it at the same time, like... like But um, that's what you want to be able to do on any of these jazz standards that you're learning. So do that, like just pick a couple, do it in all the keys and be able to do all those things and that's going to just give you light years in your abilities to, to actually function in a jazz context. Okay, now we're going to talk about transcribing and I'm going to switch the video just because it's going to be too long and um, come in. And oh, some are coming in. It's okay, come on in. Whew. Okay, hopefully this will be the last video, but I had time to snack on some Hello Panda. I swear I'm not endorsed by them. I really wish I was. Um, I don't think they endorse pianists. I don't see why they would. Uh, okay. So, now we're going to talk about transcribing. I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible because it's actually a lot of material. There are three pianists that I would highly recommend studying in depth. One is Oscar Peterson. One is McCoy Tyner, and one is Herbie Hancock. They are three of the most influential pianists. There are other ones, but you can get the most, I think, out of these specific three, because they encompass a lot of the other ones as well. Um, so Oscar Peterson, comping and vocabulary is something that um, you can get a lot from. He does a, a few different comping things. One is he mimics a lot of big band stuff with um, this, like, there's one thing that he does, um, he like scaling up through a, using pentatonic major to diminish, pentatonic major to diminished. You can, I would recommend getting that in all keys because then you can do stuff like.
know, that sort of thing that he did. Um, then there's the uh, drop two voicings that he did. I already described all that. So I would definitely do that. Vocabulary, you can get a lot from the bebop list, the list of bebop licks that I gave you. That one that I showed you. Um, but then, like, a lot of other pieces of vocabulary just by transcribing any Oscar Peterson. Literally any. There's no bad recordings of him. There are no bad recordings of him. Sorry. Um, and uh, here's another lick I, I've shown in another video. Like, so it's like... me also do his time feel. Time and swing feel is the most important with Oscar Peterson because the way that he felt swing was so precise and perfect that um, it's pretty much unmatched by any other pianist. So play along to his recordings, try to get that like... triplet feel like which I won't go into so much now I think I do in another video um, but it's all obviously not a precise triplet because that eighth note can be pushed back and forward in different amounts um but so yeah the swing feel of Oscar Peterson and oh the melodic conversation he'll do a lot of like <laughs> question, that's the question, and then the answer, and then another answer, question, question, answer, he'll like give this question and answer vibe, um, and uh, that's something that you We'll, we'll, we'll talk about with the other guys, too. So, okay, Oscar Peterson. McCoy Tyner now. Mo he... Oh, uh, Oscar Peterson's for bebop. McCoy Tyner's for modal playing. Modal meaning you pick a mode and you play within that mode. So C, Dory. up his vocabulary unless you actually learn some of it. So I have attached a, uh, I've, I've attached a sheet that my old piano teacher gave to me um, that has uh, some McCoy Tyner licks on it. So just learn those. I don't remember what they are specifically right now, but it's like a lot of, a lot of pentatonic stuff. Um, and then how he uses that, so once you learn that vocabulary, it's harmonic development and this is where we begin to learn playing outside the changes, which is really cool. So you will have like a question and answer, right? So that's a question and answer. Um, and maybe another answer. So, so let's see. So question, answer. Um, what McCoy Tyner would do would sometimes like put the answer in another key so so you have that question and answer but it distorts it in this weird interesting way and he uses that to develop by keeping track of where he goes with the keys and it originally started just by uh, by uh, superimposing tritone of uh, the the, uh, the two five one in a different way that hit a lot of the outside chord tones the extensions of the five to the one, but then it turned into actually moving all around, like.
get that stuff. I can't go into that now. It's going to take too long. Um, and then contour question and answer. We talked about that. Okay. Now Herbie Hancock. Definitely transcribe Herbie. Early and late. I would transcribe the solo from If I Were a Bell, live at the Plugged Nickel in Miles Davis's group. Because um, that has his original bebop feel, but then you want to get later, so transcribe the solo from Chameleon or Actual Proof, I would recommend if you really want to get advanced. Um, a couple little things. His comping. He would do left hand comping, like C, let's say C sus. He would like do the normal left hand comping as though you're soloing and then augment it with something on the right. Um, bye. Hello. Sorry, sorry. It's all good. Okay. So he would augment it by something in the right hand side of, um, of, uh, <laughs> sorry, band adventures going on with other band members. Uh, w that, that would mimic what a big band would do. So, like, he would give an octave and then a little chord tone in between, like a third or a fifth. Recognize that? So if you're doing like two five one to F, it's like G minor, C, F, then six, one, five, sorry, one, six, two, five, one, six, two. See, that's not Herbie. That last little bit. You probably know that already. Um, so, then, uh, okay, next about Herbie. Oh, so then you get into the, his colors. That's my, that's my shit. I can swear on this, right? This isn't a family video. So, C sus, and I do a whole video on this, of learning Herbie Hancock solo technique, but, like, this is where he does... He, he superimposes so G minor over C to make C sus, but then adds the major. And then... Um, but the, the thing to remember is that it's always different types of major or minor chords that are superimposed. So like you can pick C major, you're in C major, but then so maybe you put an A flat triad over it. Now you're at it. Put a G flat triad over it. Absolutely in love with that sound, um, and that you can use that color when you're soloing too, which is like, you know. So I would do a two in. Let's say we're in C minor. See, I did the major seven the minor, uh, and then if you're on the five, you like superimpose an A flat major minor. that sound, that's that Herbie sound. Um, okay, so that's that's transcribing. Transcribe some Herbie um, and some McCoy and some Oscar Peterson. Now, I just want to do a couple little closers here. To get fast, to play fast like I play, um, and I still wish I played faster, uh, but I haven't had enough time to practice that much lately. Uh, you practice slow, and then gradually speed it up. I started by with the metronome at 40 beats per minute doing scales at quarter notes until I got it perfect. And then, like with the form and everything relaxed, and then sped it up. Um, and that was even in college. I couldn't, I could barely do scales before that. Uh, 
So yeah, start it way, way slow. Same with the solos. Slow them down by the program transcribe or whatever. That's a program where you can slow stuff down and play it and get it great and then speed it up. That's how you're going to get good at this. Not by rushing through it. Um, it takes people lifetimes to get this, you know, well, a lifetime. <laughs> a lot of people study it their whole life. I, I am. Um, and I'm just at the tip of the iceberg. So Devlin and some other guys, oh, let me make sure this is actually still recording. Please still be recording. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to try to finish this without stopping the video. Okay, listen to recordings of Bud Powell, Charlie Parker, Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, dabble in some Stan Getz, some Oscar Peterson, some Cannonball Adderley, some John Coltrane. Listen to Miles Davis. He spans the breadth of it, but a lot of it gets really weird and will be hard to understand from a um, technical standpoint, um, though it's all brilliant and amazing. And uh, find a mentor. You need a mentor. I was really, really lucky to have Herbie Hancock as my mentor, but that did not happen accidentally. Um, you don't, you, the, the mentee chooses the mentor, so you have to pick who you admire and who you think, who you respect. If you respect their life, the way they live, the way they play, the way they exist, and learn how to, and, and ask them to, um, to help you develop your own self using the tools that they've used, like figure out what tools they've used, because you need a mentor to, to, to really get it. You need somebody who will listen to you and will and you can bounce your actual playing back and forth with. It can't just be my videos. Um, though I wish it could. <laughs> and uh, I can make videos describing any of these things in depth. It would teach an entire lifetime to teach it all, because I don't really even know that much about it in the grand scheme of things. Um, but ask me any questions that you want, that you have, and uh, I will do my best to answer. And there's, yeah, um, that's it. Um, thank you again for watching all of this blabbering that I've been doing, and I hope that you're not up as late as I am right now. Good night.